This is Neve Leibowitz speaking. I will be giving a presentation about the concentration of the Bethy Plazo concentration camp for Berman Hebrew Academy Holocaust class 2019-2020. The Plaza concentration camp was established in Krakow, Poland in June 1942 and it lasted all the way until 1945. Krakow was first established as a labor camp built upon two Jewish cemeteries. We will explore this topic later while reading the account of survivor Louis Fagan. In 1944, it became a concentration camp. Horrid conditions made Plazao unbearable. Starvation and disease were rampant. Thousands were killed, mostly by shooting. Hangings and mass shootings were common. The commandment of the camp, Amon Goth, was an especially cruel Nazi who shot people randomly for no reason. One of the horrid, horrible examples of his cruelty is that he took target practice from his balcony by shooting just people moving about in the camp, just doing nothing. At the peak of at its peak, the camp had 20,000 prisoners, consisting, most, consisting of Polish and Hungarian Jews, Gypsies, and Poles. Many Jews were, most of the Jews were um, from the Krakow ghetto, which was liquidated in 1941. So all the Jews from the Krakow ghetto were moved to the Plaza concentration camp. And as you can see, uh, the proximity of Plaza to Krakow is very close. So that's where most of the Jews, many Jews from the Krakow ghetto were moved to the Plaza concentration camp. In the summer of 1944, the SS began liquidating Plaza, sending many prisoners to their death at Auschwitz. And many were sent to other concentration camps as well. To hide the atrocities committed at Plaza, the SS exhumed and burned 9,000 corpses at Plaza. By January 1945, the last prisoners in Plaza were sent to Auschwitz. Plaza was also known as the site of where Oskar Schindler built his factory and saved Jews there. So Oskar Schindler was a German businessman who originally had a factory in the Krakow ghetto, and he slowly incorporated more Jews into his factory. And then after the, liquid, after the Krakow ghetto was liquidated, he decided to move his factory to the Plaza concentration camp. And there uh, he began housing workers in his factory, not in the camp, and also the workers' families, so as to hide them from the uh, atrocities and just the cruelty of Amon Goth. And there they were also given better treatment. Uh, Schindler gave them better treatment and, um, and allowed them to observe religious practices. And when uh, Plaza was being liquidated, he convinced Goth and the Nazis to let him keep the workers who were in his factory, which went up to about 1,000 people. And then he moved them to a factory in Czechoslovakia and therefore saved them from deportation and death. So here uh, on the other side of the poster board is a section about the commandant of the camp, Amon Goth. So Amon Goth was one of the cruelest SS members. And it was said you only survived four weeks in Plazel under him. He would shoot people randomly from his villa, shoot people while roaming through the camp on his horse, or just shoot people randomly when he felt like it. One story recounts that he murdered his Jewish dog keeper 
because the dog became more fond of the keeper than of Goth. And here are some uh, quotes. Rene, Rena Finder, one of Schindler's Jews, then 14 years old, later remembered Goth as the most vicious and sadistic man. Another Schindler Jew recalled Goth this way. When you saw Goth, you saw death. Another horrifying fact is survivors say Goth would start the day by shooting a prisoner before his breakfast. So he was really just the worst of the worst. I mean, all Nazis were horrible. All, not all SS people killed Jews and worked in the camps were horrible. But he was just the worst of the worst. And um, for the found poem, which is a poem that uh, uses just words of survivors. Uh, so this is titled Brutality from the, uh, it's by Louis Fagan, who is the survivor of Plazau, who we will be talking about. And this is from his interview on the U.S. Holocaust Museum's page. Titled Brutality. Something found on one of the people, without thinking, took out his gun, shot him. Hangings, beatings, standing next to the poor souls, laughing. Madarif sent me with Goth's uniform. I was sure one of the servants would open the door. Goth himself. I thought I was going to faint. He was quite drunk. Handed it over. Nothing happened to me. I was lucky. There was always some kind of punishment. Saddest. He was not the only one. So let me uh, explain some of the, the poem. This was taken from the interview of Louis Fagan. So the first part of the poem talks about a scene that uh, Louis describes where he was returning, he was going from the factory that he worked in back into Plaza, and the guards were searching um, work, uh, the prisoners to, to see if they smuggled anything. And the and they found some I, some contraband on one of the prisoners and goth just took out his gun and shot the prisoner right then and there and uh lewis described this as just the first time he experienced goth brutality of just someone of him just shooting the next part talks about how when the atrocities were happening in the camp the beatings or the hangings Goth would just stand there amused, laughing, enjoying it. Um, and then the the final part describes a, an enca the encounter that uh, Lewis actually had with Goth. So Madrix, who is the person, this is the owner of the factory that employed him, that employed, uh, not, not employed, but th that this is who uh, he worked for. And he had to deliver Goth's uniform to him. And when he went, he thought that it would just be one of the servants or the workers to open the door but at, at Goth's villa. But it was Goth himself. And when you're dealing with someone as a, a sadist like him, you would think that anything you do, even the slightest mistake, your your result is death. He thought his result was death. But um, it's... He opened the door, but Goth was drunk. And so he quickly, Lewis quickly just handed over the uniform and left. And he was just he f lucky. He felt lucky that nothing happened. Because when you, with Goth, you wouldn't, you would, like, the first thing that you expect is death. That's the kind of brutality that he, he displayed. And uh, after, after the war, Goth was hanged by the Polish government in 1946. Here you can see the villa in Plaza, and this is a picture of Goth. So now we can talk about uh, Louis Fagan, who is a survivor of Plaza. So I'll read this and then I'll add in uh, more, I'll add in detail as we go. 
So, Louis Fagan. As one of the people who were saved from death by being put on Schindler's list, Louis Fagan theorized that Schindler saved Jews in order to clean himself, but added he was a savior of 1,000 people, and that, that's what counts. So this, uh, in, his, in, in Lewis's interview, he went into discussion about Schindler's motives. But he concluded that no matter what his motives were, it doesn't matter why he did it. He did a thousand, he saved, a German saved 1,000 Jews. And that's, no, one, no other German saved that many Jews. And that's that, no matter what his uh, motives are. If his motives were to make money originally from the factory, he did what he did, and that's that. So, born Ludwig Fagenbaum on November 28, 1920 in Krakow, Poland, he grew up comfortably. His father owned a cycle business, and he attended a Jewish high school in Krakow. However, after the Nazis took over Poland, his school closed down, and his family was forced into the Krakow ghetto. In 1943, he was transported to the Plaza concentration camp during its construction and witnessed the desecration of the Jewish graves upon which Plaza was built on. So this is referring back to that Plaza was built on two Jewish cemeteries. So when they were building roads there, he he personally didn't uh, see this, but the people that he uh, the shared, people who actually were building the roads there, who were forced to build the roads, and they were picking up Jewish bones of from the Jewish cemetery. Something that's uh, in the Jewish religion, something very, a, a burial place is very holy. So it's definitely a very horrible thing that the Nazis did, building it on a cemetery, a holy ground. Um, so there he... Uh, did forced labor, but he was, uh, he worked for the German businessman Julius Maderich. So this was another, um, business owner who, businessman who, like Schindler, um, treated the workers in his, the Jewish prisoners in his factory. Uh, he didn't abuse them. And he gave them uh, extra food, and he allowed them also to uh, observe their religion. So similar to Schindler in Plazau, he also um, was gave better treatment to the to the Jewish prisoners. And when the Nazis were liquidating Plazau, um, since Madrich was. He was friends with Schindler. Uh, Schindler convinced to that Madrich to give some of the families that worked in Madrich's factory that they should be on Schindler's list who would go to the factory in Czechoslovakia called Brunlitz. So Fagan's family, all of his family was there. His parents and his sister and him were all in Plazau. So his, his family was one of 15 families that joined the workers from Schindler's factory uh, to move to Brunlitz in Czechoslovakia. But there was a bit of drama first because they didn't, the Nazis didn't, uh, s didn't send their train to, to Brunlitz. They sent them to the Gross Rosen concentration camp. And then the conditions were horrible there. They made them strip. They made them sleep in small barracks. And then they thought something bad was going to really happen. And then Schindler came and he saved them and brought them to Brunlitz. And Fagan describes it in his interview as the gates of heaven opening for us when Schindler walked into their barrack and presented himself. And they knew Schindler was there, so they were going to be safe. And this, so that was for the men and the women. So the men got to the, to Brunlitz quickly but the women were actually, uh, they were sent to Auschwitz. And for weeks, the men in Plazau didn't know what was going on. And this is what Fagan describes in his interview. It's a very fascinating interview. I suggest that you go watch it. Um, and he describes that they didn't know what's happening. And then after a few weeks, 
it the the women came back and he said he describes that as one of the greatest joys of his life when he saw his mother and sister come back uh so then they so then they the worker the the jewish people there at brunlitz continued um were there until the end of the war under schindler's in schindler's factory and he treated them gave them food let them religious observance i mean it's better conditions still very horrible conditions as they were prisoners in the camp um and so then they were liberated by the red army and another interesting point about fagan's story um in is in his interview he talks about how um Mrs. Schindler, who is Schindler's wife, Emily Schindler, um, was very treated the Jewish, uh, the Jewish workers very the prisoners very nicely. And for his sister, when his sister was in the infirmary, his uh, Mrs. Schindler gave her an apple and gave her extra food, and when. Lewis's glasses broke, she replaced those glasses. So just like something amazing that a German, a German woman would help Jewish prisoners like that. It's something that would never, wouldn't happen any other concentration camp at all. But it shows the, the kindness of, um, of this, of Oscar Schindler and his wife. And another interesting story is that on the the day that they were liberated before they were liberated they knew that the war was over and that the russians were coming so schindler gathered everyone and put on the loudspeakers winston churchill's victory speech on may 7th 1945 and fagan in his interview describes that it was an atmosphere of excitement and that you can feel that something was going to happen and that uh they and that most of the he and that most of the prisoners didn't understand english but still there was that feeling of excitement and that finally after all the the horrible things that they had to experience that they were going to be free and the interviewer also asks him about the speech that schindler gave because if he, in the, in Schindler's List, the movie, there's that final scene where he gives that speech, but Lewis was actually not there. He was with the underground, uh, preparing weapons in case that the German guards would attack the Jews. So he was actually preparing with the underground. So he was not there for Schindler's final speech. Uh, so just an incredible story and i i suggest that you go watch the whole interview of lewis fagan and here's a picture after the war he moved to the united states and uh, got married to a wife his wife rena here is lewis and that's his wife and that is steven spielberg the director of schindler's list so just and i think this was the my favorite part of the project uh researching and writing and listening and reading the transcript of Lewis Fagan's interview. Uh, and I recommend that you go watch it. And here is the final poster board.